Thank you for listening to Lone Star Community Radio. This program was broadcasted and recorded live from the LSCR studios in downtown Conroe, Texas. Lone Star Community Radio is supported by listeners like you. Donate and sponsor today. For more information on getting involved with Lone Star Community Radio, contact us at lscrstudios at gmail.com or visit us online at www.irlonestar.com. You're listening to Crime Scene Today, where we talk about future and current issues affecting law enforcement, crime scene, and forensic investigations. I'm your host, Dan Zintek. Joining me today, I have Mike Alexander. He is a professional, uh, been around for a while in different areas, specifically to law enforcement, uh, managed cities as a city manager, been a chief of police, and currently is a renowned speaker teaching nationwide on leadership issues. We're going to uh, start this leadership series, and, and Mike's just an incredible uh, leader and incredible instructor on these issues. And so we brought him on to talk about some specific parts of leadership, uh, coaching, mentoring, and succession. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. And uh, just to start out, how long have you been doing this now? Law enforcement, I've, I've been around for about 40, 41 years or so. And you worked from small cities, big cities, everything yeah. in between? Yeah, I started out with the sheriff's office, Travis County Sheriff's Office. I spent about three and a half years there. And I did mostly jail, and then I did a little, we did what we call a chain run, where we ran prisoners to uh, TDC. Uh, after doing that for about three and a half years, I moved over to the Austin Police Department where I spent the next 26 years doing a variety of things from patrol to what we call a district representative where I focused from a systemic perspective on crime, fear, and disorder. So anything that was systemic in nature in relation to crime, fear, and disorder, I had a caseload to deal with those systemic problems. Uh, And then I also spent some time in the schools where I taught that, that D.A.R.E. program and then my last part of my career with the Austin PD, I spent in training where I was in charge of continuing education for the entire police department. So I had continuing education and the leadership command college before I retired. So now from leaving there, you went to some uh, chief roles, city manager roles, definitely mm-hmm. taking on some of those leadership skills. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I want to talk to you about, and I guess to sort of ask, is at what point in your career does it start that you are coaching, and what exactly is coaching? Uh, coaching is really a skill set where I, as a coach, are asking what we consider to be powerful questions to the coachee. The whole purpose behind coaching is for me to create awareness within you so that you can come up with the answer. It is not my responsibility to give you the answer. My responsibility as a coach is to ask questions and so that I can create curiosity around the topic in which you want to to discuss. Typically, the client or the coachee will bring the subject or the topic to the table. Once we establish exactly what he or she wants to talk about, then it becomes my responsibility as the coach to be a truly uh, active or empathic listener. So I'm listening not only for what they are saying, but I'm also listening for the emotions behind what they're saying. And then I begin to ask questions based on what they said to me, doing a lot of reflective listening. And But the questions are designed to create some awareness within the client or the coachee so that the coachee can come up with the solution that's already embedded in their ecosystem uh, so that it, 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 it creates more buy-in when they come up with their own answer versus me giving them the answer. Now, they will come to the session sometimes hoping that I give them an answer, but that's not my role. So now, and you're speaking, uh, so they're, they're certified coaches. There's an organization that that uh, develops and has some standards for coaching. Right. Okay. Right. So that's uh, sometimes different than what we just use the term as, as coaching. 
uh, for like an employee or something like that. Correct, but, correct. So the the there's an international coaching federation where they certify certify coaches, and it takes approximately if you do it right and you go through there and there are different levels, different tiers, like PCC, ACC. There are a bunch of different tiers that you can go through. Uh, to become different levels of a coach. Um, but I went through a an institution called the Professional Coaching, uh, Pro- Professional Christian Coaching Institute. And it took me about two years to go through that process to become uh, a coach. And it's rigorous uh, training, a lot of practicum hours uh, to get to a point to where you are a professional, competent coach. So now would you say that uh, the coaching is more specifically to an individual like a life coach? Is this business coach to just cover everything? The easy answer to that question is yes, yeah. uh, but you can co- cover the gamut. So you have some people are, are exclusively life coaches. You have some people who are exclusively leadership coaches or executive coaches, but you can have a coach who can kind of vacillate between all of those. And sometimes uh, when I am coaching a client, I may go from uh, leadership to life because there is sometimes synonymous. Uh, A leader is having personal issues as well. So I may be coaching around personal issues and or life issues simultaneously. So where do you feel that this falls in the the law enforcement community? How do you feel it can benefit, I guess, law enforcement? Tremendously. Now, it's kind of new to our environment, but um, there are some wise people who are now realizing that leaders within our business can be coached and need to be coached. I do see some professionals that that is their business now going in, and I do a lot of that myself where I am coaching executives or department heads. And I, being that I I worked on both sides of the house. I worked as a city manager and I worked as a police chief. I coach both. Uh, so it depends on what the client wants or the city wants. So sometimes I'm hired or my firm is hired and I will dispatch or deploy coaches in that organization based on the assessment of the client will determine how many sessions that we need to give. But typically anywhere from six to 10 sessions hour-long sessions that are given to that client paid by the city for that person. Now, the uniqueness about it is the it's confidential for the most part, and I think you know the only time I can divulge when there's life or death kinds of situations. Otherwise, what happens between a coach and a client is confidential. What I love about coaching is that the client brings the topic. Now, the the city may tell me that this client is having performance issues. So it will be a performance-based coaching session, but the client will come to the table with the issues themselves to talk about performance. I may say that you are here, my understanding, there are some performance-related issues. So talk to me about those issues. What do you think we need to talk about? Right. So they, the city's seeing the performance, but obviously there may be an underlying issue that that's not being discussed. They might not be aware of. Right. Right. So that's what the client and I will get to. Uh, another thing to consider when coaching is during the coaching session, I may come across an issue that's deeper than coaching where the client needs therapy. They need a professional counselor. At that point, I call time out for coaching. And I now refer that person to a licensed professional counselor uh, because another way of looking at coaching versus counseling, coaching is, I always call coaching the windshield. Counseling is rearview mirror. So counselors go back into their history, pull up, the trigger or the origin of the problem and pull that client forward. The coach start where we are and move forward. Now, I'm not saying that during that process, we may not go back a little bit. 
But for the most part, that's not my intention to go backwards. My intention is to go forward. The client, the, the counselor will start going backwards and bring that person forward where I will start exactly where they are right now and move them forward. So out of uh, especially dealing with uh, law enforcement and, and leaders, do you find that there seems to be, I don't really want to say a, a common commonality, but uh, a, a topic that seems to come up more often when dealing with things that it seems to be common in the law enforcement profession? Hmm. That, that's that's a good question. So, so let me let me play with that for a moment. The question you just asked me, I consider to be what we in the coaching world a powerful question because it created curiosity in me to dive a little deeper to really think about your question because there are several different variations or nuances to your question. Usually, the client being the city. Let's say I get a call from an HR director and they're saying that this client is having uh, performance related issues. During the coaching session, what I will discover that the performance is attached to a life issue that's impeding the person's ability to perform. So I have to deal with the life issue before I can deal with the performance issue. Typically, they end up in my office because of a performance issue, but sometimes specifically it is a personal related issue that the HR director or an empo- or a leader discovered that's also attached to performance. So they may come to me to say that this client, they don't need a counselor, they need a coach, but it's a personal problem. So it's almost, I guess the best way to answer that question is performance and personal are somewhat synonymous and leaders oftentimes will want to ignore the personal issue and they will say things like your personal life isn't my problem but that's not true once that person becomes an employee everything about that person becomes a part of who you are as an agency because their personal lives will spill over eventually into the work life and it'll begin to affect three things their motivation satisfaction performance so you're going to have to deal with a personal issue before you can even address the motivation, satisfaction, performance related issue. So I tell leaders, one of the things I coach executives around, focus on, teach your leaders how to focus on the micro to mitigate the macro. In other words, the officers, what the research says is that the officers ethical compromise began when supervisors dismiss or condone minor infractions. If I know that, then it becomes my responsibility to build a relationship with you in order for you to allow me to focus on micro issues around you and your behavior without any major resistance from you. But if I don't build a relationship with you and I begin to focus on micro issues, then they're going to be major resistance. Uh, so sometimes when I'm coaching an executive who's having problems within their organization, and let's say a city manager called me and say, I value this chief, but this chief is losing control of his agency. So when I pull that chief into a session such as this, I am asking a lot of questions around what's going on so that I can get to the origin. Usually the origin are these micro issues that have built up to macro issues. So I help them deal with those, but then I help them set a system in place to where they begin to train their entire leadership cadre on how to focus on micro issues to mitigate the macro. Because if we can deal with those, we won't have as many Derek Chauvin types, Memphis Five types those kinds of things. So where do you think the breakdown comes from? Where, where do you think, have we not trained enough to, to find the micros? Do we hope they'll get better on their own? I, what's, what sort of, I guess, the, the end result of what we've been doing so far that's led to problems? Well, 
when you look at policing versus corporate America, corporate America and military. In fact, those two entities have always did a phenomenal job in relation to training their leaders. Policing, not so much. Probably the last decade, you begin to see a lot of leadership training happening within uh, the law enforcement arena. Prior to that, there was not. Um, you know, I can think back not so long ago when I promoted the first time, the only thing that was required was a 24 hour block of instruction from the licensing agency, TICO. I didn't have to do anything else. Um, now Austin PD, we did a lot more, but most agencies still to this day. I think that's still, it's all required by the state. It is that what the first line supervisor course and it's only 24 hours. You don't have to do any more leadership training for the rest of your career. And that's okay. According to the standard, which is a problem. See, but I've always found the state standard and I had a conversation with a a, a leader about this is, uh, they would, uh, only send employees to the amount of hours the state required, which 20 a year, so 40. Mm -hmm. And my argument was always, that's the bare minimum. If you want the bare minimum officer, the bare minimum standard, then you follow that. And I think it's the same for the the supervisor, right? If if you send them to the bare minimum leadership training, you're going to get the bare minimum across. Yes. Yes. That's the reason we're having the problems we're having in law enforcement today is the lack of concentration on good quality leadership training that give you a true foundation of what leadership is all about. And from there, once you get that foundation, it should be a mandatory process every year to go through some type of leadership update. Uh, But you don't find that in most agencies at all. Now, there's uh, some, some great programs out there. They're certainly available. Where would you say, because a lot of people, when they look at leadership training, uh, they start at the lieutenant level. Mm-hmm. They start with executives. Where do you see the problem needs to be addressed? Where does it need to start, right? Academy. Okay. Yeah. As a cadet, there should be a block of instruction about leadership and what leadership is what she leadership look like and what it takes to be a leader. Um, and then every year after that, every officer should go through some kind of leadership training. What is that doing? It's building an ecosystem about leadership within you, within you. And it's preparing you and preparing your agency to develop a leadership culture. Then it becomes the leader's job from the executive on down to be very intentional about how they train and prepare their leaders for the next level. As a chief of police, my job is to coach my direct reports. But not only am I coaching my direct reports, I mentor one level down. And then my direct reports will coach the people that I'm mentoring and then mentor one level below them. And so if you do that throughout the organization, you're creating a leadership culture. A definition in which I use for leadership is this, that leadership is a process of influencing human behavior to achieve organizational goals that serve the public. While I'm doing all of that, I'm developing individuals, I'm developing teams, and I'm developing the organization for future service. So I'm doing several things in there. I'm developing the individual. That means I am spending time individually with my direct reports, which also requires for me to shape each of them. Shape is an acronym. Shape meaning S stands for their strengths. If I discover their strengths, I'm also discovering their weakness. The H is their heart. Being that we are public servants should have a heart for people. So I want to know your heart. A is for attitude. And Charles Wendall said, the longer I live, the more I realize your the impact of my attitude on life. The P is for personality. I want to know your what I call or consider to be your sweet spots, your blind spots and your hot spots. Where you are as far as the essence, that's your sweet spot. Your blind spots are the water cooler conversations that people have about you instead of talking to you. Your hot spots are your triggers, 
the things that stress you out, the things that get you angry. I want to know all of those things so that I can put together a prescriptive training program to address all of those issues. Because where do I want to keep you? I want to keep you in your essence. When I see your blind spots glooming or looming or, or glaring, then I want to focus there. If I see that you're angry a lot, then I want to focus there. But I can't do that if I don't shape you. And then the E is for experiences. And what I mean there is I don't really care if it's underwater basket weaving. I want to be able to leverage the experience you bring to the table for the betterment of the organization. So I have that responsibility as a leader to deal with, with you as I, if, as I prepare every person within the organization. That's the individual. Well, and, and you mentioned as far as individual and growing them and focusing on them, and I think that that's something that in the past we've, we've missed. Uh, in the past, we focused on the task, right? We focus on what needs to be done, not on the relationship with the person. And, you know, I've, I've heard leadership defined in many ways, but nearly all of them come back to two things, influence and relationships, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And, and I believe that over the years, we're starting to realize or focus more on the relationship yeah. and the benefits of yeah. that. Yeah. This is why I love the idea or the notion of reimagining policing. Uh, this whole idea or mantra that was out there about defunding policing is, was a total mistake and totally misunderstood. And I think once they realized the mistake they made, they came back to say reimagine. Reimagine policing is the things that you're talking about now where we're teaching our leaders that being vulnerable, being compassionate, having empathy and sympathy is okay. All of those are relational issues. Getting close and engaging your people is important. And there, there are four things that every agency really need to have in place in order for that agency to be successful. One is leadership engagement. Our leaders need to be more engaged with their people. The research says that the leader or those leaders that are engaged with their employees, those employees have a tendency to outperform the average by 202%. A guy by the name of Timothy R. Clark wrote a book called The Four Stages of Psychological Safety. That's the next thing that, that agencies need to have in place, that employees need to feel psychologically safe to speak up and speak out. The third thing is that we need to, we need to be keenly aware and take notice to a person's mental and emotional stability uh, within the profession. Why? Because a police psychologist by the name of Kevin Gilmartin, who once was a cop himself, said that the profession in and of itself is predisposed to creating mental casualties. If I know that, then what systems do I have in place to address those things? And the fourth pillar that we need to have in place is making sure that the work environment itself is a healthy space for us to operate. And if you have those four pillars in place, then you're well on your way to creating the type of environment and the type of agencies that can interface with community in a very seamless way. I know, uh, you know, speaking of that, there's been certainly a shift and change in dealing with mental health. Uh, the, the previous version of years ago of suck it up and move on um, versus actually taking time uh, to realize what's going on. I, I would love to say that we're there, uh, but I, I think we are barely scratching the surface of some conversations that need to happen. Uh, I think that, as you said, even in your coaching, that there is underlying conditions that, let's just be honest, they're much easier to ignore yeah. uh, and move on than to address. Uh, the hardest part of leading is actually taking the time to know your people and be part of those people. Yeah. Um, where do you think that, I guess you'd say, that the first step or the next step, if, if we have not gotten there as an organization, how do we build a, a framework to, to make that, I guess, easier to do? Well, you got to create the culture first. And the culture need to be of such well, we don't just say, I value you as a person. I have to demonstrate that I really value you and it's okay to be not okay. 
And we need to, we need to preach that. We need to, we need to, that message need to be there. The chiefs administrators need to not be afraid of vulnerability. Uh, they need to see the human show the human side of them. And when an officer is in trouble, they really need to take care of that person and show everyone else that this person isn't okay. I've discovered that this person isn't okay. And these are the things that we are doing for them to get them right again. So that, um, that's kind of where we start in number two. Um, we need to stop being what I consider to be willfully blind. Great book written by a, a lady by the name of Margaret Heffernan. And she, the title of the book is willful blindness. It is easy as you stated to ignore the, the micro issues, but every person who crash and burn, uh, what the research also says that 99% of those things were preventable. It means that we need to be more intentional about the systems that we put in place to, to help and grow our, our officers. If I know that the profession is predisposed to that stuff, then what do I have in place? Do I have a robust uh, EAP program? Do I have a uh, police psychologist at my fingertip? Do I have a good peer support program within the organization? Are those peer supporters really trained to, to have their eyes and ears low to the ground and not and be willing to approach officers when their perception is raging? I'm not saying tangible things. I'm saying things that you believe to be true and you don't have any tangible evidence, but I make the approach, but you can't do that. If you don't elevate that peer peer support program and things of that nature, there are a lot of good programs out there that are trying their best to address these things. So I must say, I must say, that we have made tremendous progress in the field, but we still have a long ways to go. Because as we sit here talking right now, there's an officer, if not committing suicide, contemplating it. And somebody knows about it and not doing anything about it. And if they don't know specifically that they're thinking about it, they do know there's a problem. Yes, they, they've seen a change in behavior. They've seen right. a change in performance. They know something's going on. That's right. And they, they, and they say nothing. The one thing that uh, I, I, to me is sort of strange about that, in being in law enforcement any period of time, uh, you raise your senses of awareness uh, out of survival. That's right. Uh, so you know when someone is acting different or something is, is different from the norm. That's right. That's right. But <clears throat> yeah. Now we talked about coaching, mm -hmm. but you mentioned as far as mentoring. Mm -hmm and mentoring the people below you. Yeah. And I know that you've also mentored people outside whatever organization you're in. So uh, if you could sort of uh, define or explain mentoring uh, as uh, versus, I guess, coaching. Yeah, well, mentoring is a little different than coaching in that there's a skill set uh, that you're focused on. Usually uh, a person will seek out a mentor Number one, a mentor is a person that will tell you what you need to know and not what you want to hear. But there are, there are certain KSAs, sometimes knowledge, skills, and ability that a, a mentee will look for in me. If I'm, a, if I'm a chief and someone wants to be a chief, they may call me and say, hey, I have aspirations to be a chief. What are some of the things that I need to do to get there? And are, would you be willing to be my mentor to get me there? Um, yeah. And so. So if someone asks that of you and you say yes, because mm -hmm. there, there has to be contemplation and yeah. the fact that you have now agreed. Yeah. Okay. So what have you agreed to? That's what I hesitated about. Um, that means that I am about to take on every pain and woe that that person is also experiencing because I'm going to, I'm going to mentor them through all kinds of stuff. Now, what it also requires on the part of the mentee is to be extremely transparent about who they really are. 
I can't coach or mentor you um, if you don't share with me who you are. I need, because mentoring, just like coaching though, here's some similarities, is uh, the way out is in. I have to be able to get to the heart of who you are as a mentor to get you to where you want to be. So why? Because there are some impediments that's, our, that's impeding your progress to get to where you want to be. So I am going to walk with you, walk beside you, and just a, a kind of a biblical reference to all of that, it's like Psalms 23. Although you're going through this valley and you're dealing with what you're dealing with and you're feeling the pain, my job as a coach, as a mentor, I keep saying coach, but my job as the mentor as you go through it, I'm not going to take the pain away. I'm going to make sure that you have enough strength to get to the other side and answer whatever questions I need to answer for you while you're going through it and encourage you along the way to show you that you are capable. Now, what does that also require of me? It also requires that I am a little vulnerable as well, that I share with this mentee some of my ebbs and flows in life so that I will be the image bearer of what they want to become. Because obviously, a lot of times, mentees will watch a person and their life before they choose you as a mentor. And when you say yes to it, you need to recognize what you are agreeing to. Now, I've done mentorship as a paid part of who I am, but I've also done this. I've done more pro bono mentoring than paid mentoring because I, I, I enjoy seeing the light bulb come on and I love to see the person grow. So, it's not about the money for me as much as it is about your growth. Well, it's also not a an ending thing, right? right. I mean, whoever you've taken on to mentor, uh, even after they've made chief or they've right. made wherever they're going to be, that's right. Um, you're still part of it, that's and right. and they're still going to call as they come into yeah. challenges and yeah. problems. Uh, it's not an ending process. Yes. I got a I got a uh, a very good friend of mine that I've coached for years who had aspirations to be a chief. Well, he finally got the opportunity to be a chief. And he, we talked regularly. And when he got that call for, and he was a finalist, he called and said, I'm a finalist, but I've been here before. And I immediately said to him, don't do that to yourself. Don't punish yourself. Um, because what you're trying, what you're trying to say right now is, I've been here before, and I'm not going to get this one. That possibility exists. Sure. But you go into that every situation thinking that this job is yours, and when the right job, supposed to be yours, it will happen. And finally, he got that call, and the chief said, "You are my guy." And what I love about this guy is, when he got the job, he called me, and told me, "Hey, I, they hired me." And then um, on his first day on the job, on his way to work, he called and he said, hey, um, I just called. I didn't want anything. I just wanted to let you know that I'm on my way uh, to the job. And then he said, I guess I do want something. And what should I expect? Well, I wasn't available to answer the call. I'm sort of glad that I wasn't. Because I want him to be able to think on his feet and not be prepared right. for what to expect. So that because what I what I eventually shared with him, I, I said, listen, as a chief, there are going to be a lot of things that you may have your agenda set for today. But the moment you cross the threshold of your office or the building, that agenda goes out the window. And you get one phone call or one person steps into your office to tell you something and you off in a completely different direction. And you might get back to that agenda next week. Yeah. It's a saying I've said many times, people ask you, what, uh, what are you going to do today? I said, well, I can tell you what I got planned today, That's right. uh, but I won't find out what I'm doing until I get there. That's right. 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 That's the beauty of the job in a roundabout way. You can set your agenda all you want and you may not get to that agenda for two weeks. So now speaking of that, um, 
you have a lot of experience to share, uh, but we also know that we're not going to be in this profession forever, right? Uh, so the next stage, or in my opinion, you have mentoring, but then there's succession, right? right? right. And that is, you're not going to be here as someone's taken over, right? So sort of the uh, importance of that yeah. and, and how to prepare for that. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a leadership theory called uh, decision-making groups. There's technically three decision-making styles, autocratic, consultative, and group. Now, sometimes as a chief, I will use an autocratic style, but what the research says is that there's very few times where I need to be an autocratic leader. Why? Because I'm always looking to prepare the next level of leadership. So I stay as far away from autocratic style as I possibly can. So the next two on the table is consultative and group. Consultative is broken down into two categories, consultative one and consultative two. So what consultative one looks like is I come to you one-on-one and I, I, I share with you what's going on and then I ask for feedback and then I find, I make the final call. Consultative two is I share with the group and ask the group feedback and I make the final call. Group is different. Group is where I give it to the group and the group and I am a part of the group and we collectively make the decision. Now, the beauty of consultative and group is that they, being the employees, get the opportunity to see how I think why I think what I, the way I think and why or how I arrive at the decision in which I make. Now, what's the purpose there? It's really one word, intentionality. Intentionally preparing the next level of leadership. The mistake that we make oftentimes is that I or we as chiefs make decisions in a silo and your direct reports don't get the opportunity to be in the space with you while you're contemplating and trying to make decisions. They need to see your struggle as a chief or an administrator and how you arrive at whatever decision you arrive so that they can feel it, see it, experience it. So because one day they will sit there and if I do everything I do and I keep it to myself, then I'm not sharing the wealth. I have to prepare a person or several people in a very intentional way for my seat. And that is the succession of of the top job. But, you know, many times we see at the lower levels, and I know we've all seen this in our careers, where there's a person who holds all the knowledge and they feel like if they if they tell you what they do and how they do it, sometime somehow they are less valuable. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, so what ends up happening is that person leaves. And when I say leave, they may not even leave the department. They may uh, just be promoted. They may just go somewhere else, whatever. Uh, but many times they're not available anymore. There's some place that they're not even available to be called. And now you have people coming in guessing. And all that knowledge, all the experience they had is gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's um, the, the, I guess, the technical term, uh, terminology for what you just said is, is information power. So people will intentionally hoard information because they are manipulating the thoughts, feelings, and actions of others. They will hold that information and they will only give you what you need at the time instead of sharing all the information so that others can learn what you are doing. They're doing that because of some insecurity because they know once they share that information with someone else, they have lost their power. So I'm not going to give you what I know because you depending on me and I have this niche that I am the only one that knows it. Now, sometimes chiefs or administrators or leaders set situations up like that in an unintentional way and sometimes intentional, meaning that I have this go-to person that I constantly go to, and this person ends up developing a niche around this issue, and then that person realizes I am the only one that knows how to do this, and people are constantly coming to me for it. 
I cannot divulge all of my secrets because if I do, then I don't have any power anymore. The administrator need to recognize that and start sharing the wealth right. so we can spread it. How many times have we seen what you just said, that a person has all of this knowledge and then they decide to retire and they're gone and we have to reinvent the wheel and we let all of that institutional knowledge walk out the door. So secession is really about building a leadership culture from the top down, making sure that people are prepared at every level and you have things written down as far as sort of like scripts so that people know what to do just in case you pass away, God forbid, or something happens. But you have to create that, create that intentional culture. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, and I've had people try to explain that, and then they'll tell us, that, look, we got to know what you know just in case you're hit by a bus. I was like, use another example. You said, like, look, why don't you talk about, like, they, they won the lottery going with their family right, or something. Right, right, but right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, with that, uh, I certainly... I uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the many things you do. I know that you travel around the country with HR. I know you created the Lion Institute, uh, and you teach for TPCA. So um, talk about what you have going on. Talk about all your many projects and why you are hardly ever home yeah, except on occasion. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You know, th- thank God my my wife is, is retired as well, so occasionally she travels with me. But, yeah, I am. Um, seldom at home uh, and I stay fairly busy but that's a that's a blessing uh, I do a variety of things as you stated uh, I've owned the Lion Leadership Institute or Lion Organizational Development Institute uh, since 1999 uh, I was a full-time employee at Austin PD when I started this institute because I saw some leadership gaps and I began to to do a lot of different things and, and people at Austin PD gave me some opportunities uh, to, to interface with DOJ, the federal law enforcement folks. Uh, an undercover operation, did, I did a lot of training for those folks. I did a lot of uh, training for colleges. And from all of that, people constantly called. So I decided to just put this institute together uh, to use as a hub for everything that I do. Today, I am involved in a lot of organizational development things. So cities call all the time uh, to help them deal with the underbelly of the city or a specific department within the city. A lot of police departments and fire departments, I go in and I do a three-pronged process if I'm going in as an organizational development person. I do a the first piece, I, I get a temperature of the organization the second phase, I go in and I do a lot of interviews and face-to-face things. And the third phase is I do a SWOT analysis of all of the things that I discovered. That goes into executive session where I meet with them behind closed doors to talk about the, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats that are found in the organization. And the fourth thing that I do within all of that um, is I put I make recommendations for the future. And sometimes... I am attached to the future. So usually when I get hired as a consultant to do things like that, I'm usually with that agency for a minimum of one year, usually one to five years. I am with that organization as a consultant contained within that consulting or or those mentoring and coaching. So some people I mentor, some people I coach. Uh, I also deal a lot with the resilience emotional wellness uh, within organizations and help help them build a a kind of a what I call a resilient zone within the organization. Psychological safety is another another component that I deal with within organizations. So I do I deal a cadre. So of, you're busy. I, you're yes. very busy. <laughs> yes, I am. I, I, yes. And um, it People call me for all kinds of things. Uh, sometimes they want me to touch every employee in the organization, and I do that. I just got a call just a couple of days ago for an organization. They want me to touch every employee in that organization. So, so in all the many uh, expertise that you have, 
and just your willingness to share all that. So how does someone get in touch? What's the website for Lion Institute? Um, the website is, uh, of course, www.thelion, T-H-E-L-I-O-N, dot institute. Okay. And that's the that's the website. Okay. So they can find you on there. If someone has interest in many of the things we talked about, uh, many of the things that you teach, uh, again, I know you also uh, teach through TPCA. Mm-hmm. We got a course going on this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're actually just finished that today. That's what we're that's what we're doing right now. So uh, yeah, so many opportunities uh, to listen to Mike hear his expertise and and just share his knowledge. So Mike, thank you so much for taking time out to do this with us today. Appreciate it so much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for listening to Crime Scene today. If there's a topic that you'd like covered, if there's a guest you'd like on the show, or if you'd like to sponsor the show, you can reach out to me at dan at crimescenetoday.com. Thank you for listening.